What's up road trippers, Buenos Dias ballpark fans, and hello baseball enthusiasts. My name is Nick Carey. Welcome to the American Ballpark Road Trip, where we showcase baseball teams at all levels, their home ballparks, and the communities surrounding them. Today we are on a mission to showcase the beautiful city of San Antonio and Nelson Wolf Stadium, home of the San Antonio Missions of the AA Texas League. So grab your favorite ballpark cerveza, sit back, relax, and enjoy the trip. Throughout this episode, we'll show you parts of Wolf Stadium and sites around the city of San Antonio, in addition to taking you behind the scenes. We're in the mascot dressing room here at Nelson Wolf Stadium. I am with Jen Mahoney <laughs> and Jeremy Sneed, the director of public relations with the San Antonio Missions. Tell ballpark fans watching what you do with the team exactly. Yeah, yeah. and first of all, I mean, thank you guys for coming out. It's always always nice to, yeah. to showcase showcase the wonderful uh, Nelson Wolf Stadium. So for me, I cover a lot of a lot of bases per se, um, mainly you know, media relations. So anything involved in the press box, um, game notes, press releases, roster updates, social media stuff. But then outside of the ballpark, stuff with uh, donations. People can reach out to me about donating tickets, donating items. Um, if they want the mascot to be at their at their event, they'll reach out to me to get that stuff scheduled. And then occasionally doing stuff like this as well. Throughout this episode, we'll show you things to see and do at Wolf Stadium and around the city of San Antonio. Our first stop takes us to its most recognizable landmark. Today it's known as the Alamo and commonly remembered for 13 fateful days in 1836 in the Texas War for Independence and now also the final resting place of legendary frontier figures like Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie. But this remaining church is part of what was once a larger and more sprawling complex that was established in 1718 when two missions merged to become the Mission San Antonio de Valero. The church construction began in 1744 and completed in 1757. By the turn of the 19th century, this religious center had turned into military fortification and was home to a company of Spanish cavalry who originally hailed from Alamo del Perez, Mexico, leading San Antonio locals and colonists to give the complex the Alamo name. The Alamo Chapel and several exterior walls are all that remain of the original sprawling complex of the mission-turned-military fortress. Today, the chapel honors the Alamo defenders and the structure's rich history as a religious site. Through its history, the Alamo has played a role in multiple conflicts and changed hands a number of times, from Spain to the Republic of Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the United States government, where it served as an army quartermaster depot, to the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, and even a private owner, and for a while, the Roman Catholic Church. But the remaining chapel and four-foot walls like this one hold the history of nearly three centuries of the city of San Antonio. So it goes without saying, the San Antonio Missions baseball team rely on that history of the city of San Antonio and use the visage of the Alamo and the Alamo complex within their team branding. The modern Alamo complex spans 4.2 acres and officially received designation as a National Historic Landmark in 1960. Then, in 2015, it was named by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site along with the San Antonio Missions National Historical Park. It's Texas's first UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. 
archaeological excavations and preservation continues, even as additions are made to the complex, including the Ralston Family Collection Center, opened in March 2023. The two-story collection center is home to artifacts from the Donald and Louisiana Spanish Colonial Collection and the collection of a name familiar to music fans, eight-time Grammy winner Phil Collins. Collins even lends his voice to narrate the action of the 1836 battle for the Alamo, detailed on the diorama on the center's first floor. The Mexican troops eventually secured a foothold on the dilapidated north wall. And breaking through the weakened area, they crawled over the... Collins was captivated with frontiersman David Crockett as a child after watching the 1950s Disney series starring Fess Parker which fueled his lifelong passion for the history of the Alamo, where Crockett's life came to an end. The artist conveyed that passion into developing what's considered a preeminent collection of artifacts from the Texas Revolution. He eventually gifted that collection to the people of Texas in 2014. The Alamo gift shop even sells a book Collins authored detailing the pieces in the collection and their respective histories. The artifacts housed within the collection center, from muskets to cannons to well-preserved historical documents, speak for themselves. They tell the history of the Alamo complex as part of Spanish colonization, Texas's fight for independence from Mexico, the 13-day siege of the Alamo by Mexican forces under the command of General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, and at the cost of the Alamo defenders' lives, the eventual establishment of the Republic of Texas. The Collection Center also showcases examples of the lasting impact of the Alamo and battle through memorabilia, art, films, and much more. The Calvary Courtyard allows visitors to escape the sun under shady Texas pecan trees and take in the statues of figures like Alamo Courier, Juan Nepomuceno Seguin, Colonel William Barrett Travis, Alamo Courier and future Texas politician John William L. Colorado Smith, the inspiration for the Yellow Rose of Texas, Emily West Morgan, frontiersman and Alamo defender James Bowie, and Texian Army guide and spy Hendrick Arnold. Don't miss the statue of Tejano Alamo defender Jose Trubillo Lozoya on the southwest corner of the complex pointing toward the Riverwalk. What do you recommend maybe some hidden gems folks should see when they visit San Antonio on their own trip? Yeah, so obviously obviously the Riverwalk is the is the big thing, yeah. of course, and obviously you should see you should see the Riverwalk. It's really nice and just to, you know, definitely check that off the list. Uh, I myself, I really like the Pearl. Um, it's a, it's kind of attached to the Riverwalk a little bit, but they have a nice little area where if you just want to grab a coffee, if you just want to grab like grab a wine or something, want to read a book, want to bring the dog for a little bit of a walk, yeah. um, they've got a nice little seating area there. They got some shops, they got some restaurants, but it's a little bit more low key than the yeah. Riverwalk is. In more than 130 years, there's been no shortage of talented players who've called San Antonio home including 27 Texas League Hall of Famers and nine National Baseball Hall of Famers. They include Mike Piazza, Ross Youngs, Brooks Robinson, Joe Morgan, Dennis Eckersley, Ron Santo, Pedro Martinez, Billy Williams, and Negro League great Willard Home Run Brown. Other notable names not forgotten are Fernando Valenzuela, Felix Hernandez, Adrian Beltre, Oral Hershiser, Fernando Tatis Jr., and distinguished longtime minor league manager Phil Wellman. Our visit to San Antonio also took us to the final resting place of another Hall of Fame baseball legend. Not every day that you encounter a baseball Hall of Famer, or in this case, the final resting place of one. Here at Mission Burial Park South in San Antonio, we've managed to find the final resting place of George Edward Rubadell, 
a first celebrity, if, so to speak, in baseball, and one of the primary reasons, as it's been cited, that the American League flourished when it did in its establishment. He was known as one of the premier left-handed pitchers of his time and still regarded as so in baseball. Now, he was also known for his eccentricities on and off the field, and that's where the name Rube came from. But he did such things on the field as was one of the very first to throw an immaculate inning, nine pitches, three strikeouts, had four 20-win seasons in a 13-year career, several hundred career wins. But he was also known for his dedication to community, assisting firefighters whenever he could, and in 1911, was assisting a small town dealing with icy floodwaters when he caught a case of pneumonia. That led to declining health, and in 1913, he was moved with his sister in San Antonio and later a sanitarium to ensure that he could get back to health. Unfortunately, he passed away and in 1914 was buried in a pauper's grave. But when finding out, both Ben Schreib and his business partner, longtime Philadelphia Athletics owner, Connie Mack, ensured that Rube Waddell would be remembered properly for the baseball legend he was and the person he was with this grave marker. He's interred here with his father John and his mother Mary and after his enshrinement in 1946 should be remembered not only for the great baseball player he was, the fireballing left-hander on the field, but also for the person he was and his dedication to the communities around America that he served. The baseball field here at Pittman Sullivan Park in the Denver Heights neighborhood of San Antonio is the current home of the Texas Dingers. But before the Sandlot Revolution came to San Antonio, this field played host to baseball history that has to be seen and experienced. Teams like the San Antonio Black Sox, the San Antonio Yankees, Reds, and San Antonio Ramblers of the South Texas Negro League, which was founded in 1949 and lasted for nearly the next three decades, called this field home. At the same time in the 1950s and 60s, in the midst of segregation across the American South, this field changed lives in this Denver Heights neighborhood, providing opportunities to learn and play baseball to African American youth who, with those Jim Crow laws and segregation, may not otherwise have been able to. So when you make your road trip to San Antonio, don't forget your glove and maybe catch a Sandlot game here at Pittman Sullivan Park in the Denver Heights neighborhood. Can you tell us a little bit about the missions and the Copa de la Diversión initiative? It was something that Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball wanted to do as a way for teams to incorporate that appeal to their Hispanic fans and the Hispanic culture. Um, so teams were allowed to come up with alter egos. And so the creative minds in San Antonio <laughs> came up with Flying Chanclas de San Antonio. and. Really, it's taken on a whole shape of its own. Uh, we have people that sometimes, if they're not familiar with baseball, they think the Flying Chanclas are their own team because of how unique it is. Um, but from what I was told when I got here in 2019, that when they initially launched Flying Chanclas here, uh, the initial order of merch was sold out within 24 hours. Wow. Um, and we still have a big enough demand for Flying Chanclas that on game days, our team store manager sets up a second team store on the concourse that's strictly for Flying Chancla's merchandise while keeping the missions team store open as well. La Vieta, Market Square, 
if you want yeah. a little bit of that culture side. Um, try to come down for Fiesta. That is a great time. It's usually yeah. um, the end of March, early April. It's kind of like San Antonio's version of like Mardi Gras. The history of San Antonio's historic market square began in 1730 when the plaza it sits upon was gifted to the original colonists of the city by King Philip V of Spain. Since that time, it's been home to a host of artisans and vendors, but it also served as a cultural melting pot as San Antonio continued to grow in its early history. At night, in its earliest days, the chili queens would descend upon the market to sell chili-inspired dishes and spicy stews, the likes of which inspired authors like O. Henry. By the 1960s, foot traffic had decreased to the market and vendors were moving away as their businesses flourished, leading the powers that be to create the first market committee who worked with nationally renowned architect Boon Pao by 1976 revived the market into the vibrant shopping district it remains today for both San Antonio locals and visitors. The market's outdoor plaza and farmer's market stage are home to events almost every weekend of the year as well as live performing artists. And USA Today Reader's Choice Awards named this one of the 10 best public market in the country, making it a worthy detour with offerings for all ages when you visit San Antonio. Known simply to locals as El Mercado, the market. Historic Market Square is comprised of seven buildings, including the Centro de Artes, and provides spaces both outdoors and indoors for dozens of vendors, artists, and several restaurants. Here you can find anything from San Antonio-themed souvenirs, to artwork, to clothing, to luchador masks. Or, like we found from the amazing crew at Texas Boots, handmade boots and fine leather goods and a variety of cowboy hats to make any Texan proud. Before the rest of our adventures, we even stopped for a snack break with roasted corn in a cup and a variety of toppings. might be one of the only people who's been in the mind of the famous Balapino mascot. That's right. <laughs> so, um, how did you come to, to find your way to the mission? So I, uh, I have a really good friend. His name is Rob Olivares. He owns uh, Party Pals SA. Um, they're a mascot company. We do birthday parties, um, just anything. We do some other uh, corporate mascots like Rico's Cheese. Uh, via transit, which is local okay. uh, transportation, and just some other stuff. And he's got a bunch of characters, too. But anyway, the missions had reached out to him. Hey, we need, we're looking for a company to do the mascot for the, the missions. And so he put a post on Facebook saying, hey, guys, I'm having Balapeno tryouts if anybody wants to try out. And me, I was just popping off. I was like, well, I have Chuck E. Cheese experience if you don't find <laughs> anyone. <laughs> yeah. And then he texts me a few days later. He's like, Jen, I need your help with the trials. I was like, yeah, what do you need? I need you to try out. So I tried out, you know, yeah. I was really nervous and everything, but um, that's how I came to life with Balapeno. Yeah. The missions have called Nelson W. Wolf Stadium home since 1994. It accommodates sellout crowds of up to approximately 9,200 fans in both seats and an outfield berm. For group outings, the ballpark features 14 luxury suites, large group areas down each baseline, and two party patio areas. Tell us a little bit about the ballpark itself, how it came to be, and, and what big part it plays in the San Antonio community. Yeah, so of course um, the, ball, uh, the city of San Antonio has had professional baseball since 1888. So our franchise dates back over 100 years, which is 
nuts to think about. The missions have always been around. So at our ballpark, it's been around for about 30 years, um, but I think that adds a little bit of a little bit of charm. It's a little oh, yeah. little nostalgic, but we keep adding new new things to it every year. Um, we're up here right now in one of our hospitality areas. Um, we've got a 21 and older bar at the ballpark. We have another bar on the t on the second floor. Um, but really, what we offer to the community is just a family-friendly environment, something that's affordable for the family. We do $2 Tuesdays where people can purchase $2 tickets, get $2 um, sausage wraps at the games, discount beer, all that fun stuff. Thursdays we do value night, so it's half-price parking, half-price tickets. Uh, we do giveaways every Friday, fireworks every Saturday, bark in the park. Um, so just different things like that, just to try to make sure that people have somewhere fun to bring the family yeah. to, um, whether it's Tuesday, whether it's Sunday, whether it's Thursday, whatever night that is. During our visit, the Missions, the Texas League affiliate of the San Diego Padres, hosted the Amarillo Sod Poodles, the AA affiliate of the Arizona Diamondbacks. We have a skit that we come up with every single game, so middle of the first. Um, so we have to yeah. come up with those own skits, so like we just kind of like, what would Balopeno do? So yeah. when it's Balopeno and Taco, he's hidden back there, but when it's Balopeno and Taco, they have this um, connection with each other. They just like to pull pranks on each other a lot. They just yeah. have a lot of, you know, yeah. character like that with each other. And like yeah. last night, we teamed up with the magic trick to get a fan. Yeah. <laughs> so. brought you the team here. So I'm from the Chicago suburbs originally and went to school in Southern Illinois um, to pursue broadcasting, yeah. but working in baseball was primarily everything I had always wanted to do as a yeah. kid. Same here. So when broadcasting wasn't really working out, um, I started looking at Major League Baseball, internships, stuff like that to see what I could do. Started learning about media relations, public relations, yeah. and thought, oh, it's kind of like journalism in, an ass oh, in yeah. an essence, I could do that. And thankfully the missions gave me a shot in 2019. My, my boss had a similar background of pursuing broadcasting, ending up doing PR. Um, then I went to intern with the Tampa Bay Rays and their broadcast department. Then COVID happened, a position opened up here, um, reached out, said I'd gladly come back if you guys need somebody. And they hired me a month before the 2021 season started. How does Balapino, Malapino, Henry the Puffy Taco, how do they get out in the community and what do they mean to that community? Yeah, so a lot, especially during the beginning of the season, they have um, a lot of Little League opening days. Yeah. So we love going to those. Uh, the kids love seeing Balapino, oh, the mascot. Yeah. Um, lots of high fives, you know, lots of pray, you know, how the opening day stuff is, yeah. <laughs> ceremony stuff. Uh, sometimes he gets through a little first pitch, you know, it just depends. <laughs> you know, Balapena likes to do that. He does go out to Lackland Air Force Base sometimes, uh, do stuff cool. with the kids yeah. out there. Uh, big military city, of course, you yeah. know, Military City USA. <laughs> so we definitely support um, anything the military does around here. The 
submissions ensure fans of all ages can take part in the fun at the ballpark, whether they're on the field between innings, testing their skills catching a pop fly, or sprinting to steal a base of their own. Long-running promotional nights include used car night, where, just as the name suggests, fans have a chance to take home a used car, and shirt off our back night, where one lucky fan wins an autographed game used jersey. And in recent years, the mission's giveaways to fans have included replica jerseys, flying chancla mugs, Hawaiian shirts, and bobbleheads of team alums like Fernando Tatis Jr. And of course food, there's all sorts of great food around here, whether it's the local chains like Whataburger and Bill Miller or any of the family owned places that are just scattered around beautiful San Antonio. Shiloh's was established in 1917, making it the oldest restaurant in San Antonio. The eatery specializes in serving delicious German and Texan fare for breakfast and lunch. Since 1942, Shiloh's has called its current location home in a former currency exchange bank just off the Riverwalk. Originally founded as a saloon, during Prohibition, they swapped draft beer for root beer and continue to serve their own brand of the soft drink today, alongside specialty dishes like deviled eggs, schweinenschnitzel, and potato pancakes. Don't miss in-house desserts like their Texas sheet cake with root beer ganache and take home sweets like pastries or a six pack of Shiloh's root beer. Back at Wolf Stadium, the missions provide plenty of can't miss food fare, like brisket tacos at the dish, Texas chili nachos or foot long corn dogs at the sandlot, specialty hot dogs at the doghouse, pizza from San Antonio's own Sofia's Pizzeria, and many more, mostly fried, guilty pleasure eating options or sweet treats, like Bahama Bucks Shaved Ice, a Texas original. And to cool off, don't forget a cool drink or ballpark brew for a warm night enjoying the ball game. One food you can't miss at a missions game is Henry the Puffy Taco, a longtime fixture of the ballpark experience. Sponsored by Henry's Puffy Tacos, a Mexican restaurant with two locations in San Antonio, since 1989, Henry has raced a young missions fan around the bases and hilariously never quite manages to reach home plate for the win. Yeah, sure. so balapeno yeah. and taco, even mama peno over here, um, we love making the fans laugh. You know, it's either you're making somebody laugh, making kids yeah. cry, making kids happy, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, even the adults, like, you know, it's minor league baseball. That's what I love about minor league baseball because it's just the atmosphere is just a fun environment. And balapeno and mama peno and taco definitely add uh, to that environment. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, they just like to make people laugh and just get yeah. the crowd going like that. That's
Just like some San Antonio Missions players have bright futures ahead as they progress through the minors with hopes of becoming future San Diego Padres, the city of San Antonio will continue to have a bright future of Missions baseball. The Missions were previously owned by the pioneering Elmore Sports Group, and in November of 2023, after months of negotiations, ownership of the Missions was returned to local interest for the first time since the mid-1980s when designated bidders LLC purchased the team. The ownership group is comprised of local San Antonio business and civic leaders in addition to Ryan Sanders Baseball, the minor league ownership and operating group owned by the families of Hall of Fame pitcher and native Texan Nolan Ryan. As beautiful of a facility as Nelson W. Wolf Stadium continues to be, new standards mandated by Major League Baseball will limit future use of the ballpark by the missions. Several locations for a new ballpark, including one near downtown San Antonio, have come and gone before and after our visit. But under their new local ownership group, there's no doubt the missions will continue to prosper and provide affordable family entertainment to San Antonio for years to come. In the meantime, the Wolf, as it's been known, will serve as home to the missions, act as a time capsule of ballparks of the early 1990s, and reminder of three Texas League All-Star games it's hosted, and countless prospects and fans who've called this field home. As if a walk-off victory by the missions wasn't exciting enough to cap off our ballpark road trip, we enjoyed a post-game drone show and plenty of reminders of just how special it can be to visit San Antonio, Texas. With us being around for so long, it's really just that steady force in San Antonio that you can always lean on to, that the missions yeah. are always gonna be here. Thanks for joining us for this episode of American Ballpark Road Trip here from Nelson Wolf Stadium in the beautiful city of San Antonio, Texas. I think we can call this mission to see the San Antonio missions, mission accomplished. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to give it a like and make sure you're following us here on our channel on YouTube. And share this video with a fellow ballpark traveler or baseball fan and follow us on your preferred social media for future ballpark content. Thanks again for joining us here from San Antonio, Nelson Wolf Stadium. My name is Nick Carey, and we'll see you on the road. Thank you so much for spending some time with us, showing us the ballpark. American Ballpark Road Trip. Absolutely, it was a pleasure, so thank you. Yeah.